All right, let's, uh, let's begin with a prayer, and we'll get into it. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you, and, and we come before you humbly and boldly, as the Scripture says, uh, and we just appreciate everything that you've done for us, Lord. We could never say thank you enough. We could never do anything ever to make up for what you've done for us. The salvation that you've purchased us with your blood is, is it's infinite, it's priceless, and there's nothing we could ever do to get it. And we can stress that truth over and over and over, but yet we, in our, our daily life, how we live our life out, we, we forget that, Lord. But as we look at what it really means to have a relationship with you, I pray you would help us to truly see, truly hear, truly comprehend what it means that you died for us and what it means to have a relationship with you. And, and, and we thank you and we bless your mighty name and I just pray you'd, you'd fill us all with your spirit, help us all put, put aside our weak flesh. Lord, help me to say what you'd have me to say, help everybody to, to hear and take in the information and, and apply it, Lord, and just, just thank you for what you've done and we love you. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So last week we looked at a bunch of apologetic topics of how to defend the faith against uh, foolish arguments against it. And this week we're going to look at, look at an inside view of what Christianity means, what it means to be a child of God, and specifically the difference between relationship and religion. Now, it's important to understand. We all know the the saying, I have a relationship, not a religion. And that's true. That's, Christianity is about a person. It's not about a, a set of moral uh, ethics in which we follow. Um, but if, you, if you're sharing the gospel with somebody and they don't know anything about Jesus or the Bible or anything like that, and you tell them, oh, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship, you're just going to confuse them. Because Christianity, by definition, is a religion. Um, so if you tell somebody that, that we don't have a religion, but we do, it's going to confuse them. But in our instance, we understand the distinction. So when, when we say religion, we're talking about a set of uh, things that we have to keep, like a, a ladder to God, things we have to do to, to work our way to God. That's when we say religion, our, our vernacular or our understanding, that's what that means. So when I say we have a, a relationship, not a religion, we, we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved by what he's done. Everything that he's done for us is what purchases us salvation not our own efforts, not our own works, not what we call religion. But I just want to make that distinction because I've seen confusion in, in people before sharing the gospel and they're like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You don't have a religion. Christianity is a religion. So it's just important to understand who we're talking to when we talk about uh, things like this. But um, our text is going to be Romans chapter 7. And if you would stand for the, the reading of, of God's word, I think this is going to help us to internalize it better, perhaps. Uh, but it's going to be Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. And I'm going to start, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, something I've been learning recently, the Lord has been showing me, is how to have proper expectations in our walk with the Lord. And this is going to be the main focus of what we look at here. It is true that the Bible does give us a set of, of rules, a set of expectations that God 
uh, expects from us, like not to murder people, not to steal and things like this, and, and there's many more commandments. But the difference, the distinction is in, in our expectations. So if our focus is on a, a religious mindset or worldview, we're going to be trying to do things in our own strength versus if we're keeping our eyes on Jesus, we're going to let him work through us. And we're going to look specifically uh, at those things. But the, 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 thing with the, the problem with the Christian life for many is, is that it breaks down when people are viewing it the wrong way. So when people are viewing it as a religion, as a set of just a moral ethic or a moral code of what to do to make their way to God, it's going to break down. Uh, and this is, this is in distinction to when we see it as a relationship. And, and many people do believe the Christian life to be a moral code, uh, one of many today, which actually, in fact, every religion in the world except for Christianity has a workspace system. Every single one of them says you have to work your way to the top, to, to the Lord. Uh, you have to repent, do the right thing, and then you'll be good, pretty much. Uh, but as we'll see, that's a system that fails. That's a system that leaves people broken and discouraged and hopeless. And we actually, as, as, as children of God, as saved children of God, we can become hopeless and dis distraught and discouraged as well if we take our eyes off of Jesus and focus on just keeping the commandments and not a relationship with him. We're still saved, but we're going to have a depressing Christian walk. Um, it, it says later in, in this text that uh, for those who, who are focusing on a religious system on keeping commandments on, on they're placing all their emphasis and all their trust in, in what they can do for God instead of Jesus himself uh, on the good days they feel good they feel satisfied like they've done a, a good thing but on bad days that's when the depression hits that's when the the hopelessness hits and then they just depending on how bad it is they could just stop wanting to serve the Lord and if we have proper expectations of what what the Bible tells us what a proper biblical understanding of um, the line between, yes, God expects certain things from us, and on the other side of that, uh, we have grace. If we can understand the proper expectation of that, when we fall, we will not lose all hope. We'll get back up. We understand God forgives us, um, and we'll, we'll keep going. It says in Proverbs, a just man falls seven times, but gets right back up. And in distinction to that, the, the religious man, the one, even the Christian who, who is saved, that the, the one that places their faith in what they can do for God, what they can try to, uh, they want to try to work their way to the Lord. Uh, when they fall, they're going to fall hard. And that's not the Christian walk. That's a life of just pain, misery, hopelessness, and um, it's, not, it's not joy. You know, Scripture it tells us to be joyful. Rejoice evermore. It's actually a commandment. Uh, but living a life like that is not going to be joyful. So, um, a system of religion is what many people deem Christianity to be. Uh, a system of religion that conforms one to a high standard of ethical behavior. But the fact is, no matter how disciplined we are, no matter how long we study, pray, and work, it'll never be enough for the perfect eternal God. Nothing we could ever do will be, be enough for him. And if we started in Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, and if we mapped out all the expectations, the, the do's and the don'ts of Scripture, we would end up with the entire Bible. There's a lot of expectations in the Bible. But then if we focused on doing it all perfectly for the rest of our life, with 100% of our effort, we would still come to the end of life broken and failing. Uh, not to mention that we would be absolutely exhausted and disillus disillusioned. There's a good word. Disillusioned from trying. Now, we might, through, through our effortless, or through our effort of, of toil and, and pain and struggle, we might become better than the guy, become better than the guy down the street, uh, but we would still uh, harbor pride. We may be able to, to follow these commandments to a T, and I, I'll make this side note, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. We are expected to, to follow God's commandments and to do the right thing. But again, I, 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 I stress emphasis on the line between grace and expectation, and we're really going to try to hone in on how to have a proper expectation, a proper biblical worldview, uh, which will not bring us into, uh, I'll use that word, disillusionment when we, when we do fail. But instead, we'll, we'll understand that we're forgiven, that our, our salvation, our uh, relationship with God is not dependent on how well or how, how uh, weakly we can serve him. Uh, but, you know, say someone expends all effort to, to try to do the right thing all the time in their own power, they might become visually better, they, like a Pharisee. They may be, look visually better than everybody else, but they would still on the inside be dirty. Um, they'd be proud. They'd still struggle with self, uh, sin, faithfulness, idolatry. 
They'd still be groaning and uh, wrestling their way through life, but just like the rest of us. And, and compared to God and his holy perfection, our best efforts merely bring us to our knees in utter hopelessness and inability. And what it does, it adds up all to filthy rags. And if you look at your handout there, Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Uh, if the Christian moral life, excuse me, if the Christian life is a moral code, we can't do it. Nobody can. It's impossible. But does that mean that we throw our hands up and walk away from God? Do we abandon any offer, uh, effort to honor Jesus in this life? And of course, that's not what we do. Uh, does it mean that we are destined to condemnation? Or does it mean that we have no hope but to sit down in the mire of failure and get used to it? No, these are all extremes. So whether we're, we're wrestling our way through or trying to throw our hands up uh, in failure, uh, th these extremes are destructive to our relationship with Jesus. Now, religion, again, I mean uh, moral systems or, or a set of codes that we follow to try to earn acceptance with God. Uh, religion, it's, it's no nothing other than a well-oiled system of, of climbing to God. It implies structure and performance and self-improvement. And it, it, it um, includes discipline, which all these things ultimately bring, uh, which they believe brings them into a more, uh, a better relationship, I could say, with God, a more favorable position with God. They believe that doing all these things would put them higher up on, on the ladder. And we'll talk about the ladder. But ultimately, it's about earning God's approval by getting at your act together and behaving well. And it's, it's a lot like elementary school. If you behave well, you get extra recess. But if you behave badly, you go to the principal's office. And unfortunately, a lot of people have that idea of God. It's like that he's a, he's a dictator. He's a, he's a hard taskmaster that if we don't do the right thing, he's going he's gonna to hate us. He's going to be standing over us with a whip, and he's just going to condemn us. But that's not the, the God we serve, not at all. Uh, religion is uh, sometimes about behaving well for God, other times it's about behaving well for others, uh, like our church, our friends, our social network, our pastor. But either way, what religion is, it's, it's, about, it's about me. It's my achieving. It's my doing something for somebody or something. It's my winning approval uh, from, from others. And this is what's called a performance-based acceptance. This tactic works well in the secular marketplace, the, the non-religious marketplace, but does not work well with, with uh, a walk with Jesus trying to, to earn acceptance from Jesus by our own performance. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hinder our relationship with him. And, and these systems certainly have nothing to do with salvation or gaining or keeping God's love or acceptance. Uh, but often, sadly, Christians quickly move from grace to works in, in their practical theology. In, in other words, we could say that none of us would say that we trust our religion to our, our works to save us eternally, we do trust uh, in Jesus. We all, we all would admit that we're, we're saved by grace through faith. But when it comes to how we're living out our life, how we're actually being practical, practical about our life, oftentimes we, or just a Christian body, uh, we, we, we look at God as someone um, that if we, just, if we just do the right thing, we'll keep him smiling and we'll keep him off of our backs. Uh, but that's not, that's not the case. We have, we have a faulty expectation of, of who God is. So what happens is we actually move subtly from saving faith to, to a working religion, a working religion, all so we could stay out of trouble with God. And, and of course, don't get me wrong, God is going to discipline us when we do wrong, but we don't have to, to walk around cowering in fear all the time. Did I do this right? Did I do this wrong? We, we need to search the scriptures and align ourselves to the scriptures the best way we can, and then we give the rest to the Lord. And the Lord's really been teaching me recently, I've been trying to worry about things that are out of my control. And that's just, a, it's a pointless pursuit. It's hopeless. It just takes, no, it does nothing but take away from our day, from our joy, from our hope. So we need to, we need to do everything in our power. Uh, the, the decisions we make should be perfectly, as best as we can, perfectly aligned with the scripture. And then the rest, we give it to the Lord. And, and the Lord knows our heart. Um, he sees that we've tried our best. Say, say we don't know what decision to make or we have uh, a stressful situation coming up. Just, we, we can pray, Lord, help me to do what I'm supposed to do and then give the rest to you. But too often we, I mean, we, we, we do do, uh, <laughs> we do what we are supposed to do, but then we, we try to, to worry about what we can't do. And that just causes uh, much trouble for us. Uh, but all this causes is a fading relationship. 
and uh, in, in, in say uh, or in terms of, of religion of this, this workspace system, the beauty and wonder of belonging to Jesus becomes a murky and a foggy struggle with anxiety and uncertainty. We're always wondering if he's upset. We're always hoping if we're or, or hoping that we're impressing him. We're always trying to measure up. What it becomes is exhausting and fear-filled. And at some point in our minds, uh, th- this made me laugh because I, I have to catch myself from doing this, but at some, at some point in our minds, Jesus turns from Savior to Sheriff. Uh, he, you know, he was good enough to die for us, but once he saved us, he, he just turned into to a hard guy. But we know the Scripture says that, that uh, his yoke is easy and, and his burden is light. The Lord help us to, to remember that and to apply that. But what, what happens is we can move from being accepted to accused and our relationship becomes religion. So we all acknowledge, we all believe that we're saved by faith, uh, or saved by grace through faith. But then what happens is we, we start to slowly, slowly, slowly start to trust in our works. And this doesn't, um, this doesn't make us lose salvation or anything. All it does is just take away from our joy and make us live uh, in, in a very um, hopeless, I mean, t- t- for lack of a better term, but just a hopeless, hopeless situation. And we don't have to live like this. The scripture gives us a clear, a clear path of how we can live. We're actually supposed to be happy and joyful and peaceful. Uh, scripture says that the, uh, the peace of God surpasses all understanding. And we can ask ourselves, when's the last time we really felt the, the, the true peace of God where we're at rest? And, and by no means does peace, we also have trouble defining these words. We forget what these words mean. Peace does not mean um, shelter from all trouble. We're, we're guaranteed persecution and trial and persecution. Peace means essentially being, um, understanding that you're forgiven and being okay with the, the result and understanding that God has everything in his hands. And he's, he's handling it. He's doing it. But when we come to a trial or, or a trouble, we, we can easily lose peace because we, we don't understand what the term means. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. But, yeah, Jesus moves from being our Savior to our Sheriff uh, we move from being accepted to accused. Our relationship becomes religion, and security gives way to sweat. And this cycle spirals downward and downward into discouragement and resignation until the person says, I quit, I can't do this, this is not fun. And the Christian life is supposed to be fun. Um, it's supposed to be full of hope, of joy, of happiness, of wonder, uh, like a child. I, I read, um, or I heard the story about this guy, he took his his child to a, like, two-year-old child to a, to a merry-go-round, and they were a little bit hesitant to get on it at first, but once they got on it, they were just going around in an absolute awe and wonder of the lights and all the shapes and everything, and he was just really drawing attention to how children have this, just this awesome wonder of the world, and we, we have lost that, it seems, the older we get, but we just pray that the Lord would, would renew that in us, because this, I mean, this world that we live in, it really is uh, it's magnificent. It's a wonderful creation of God. But we, we go through the, the routines and the motions and we forget at, at what he's made, what he's done, and it just makes us sad. But that's not the way we have to live. We don't have to live in an exhausting and fear-filled manner. manner. Uh, but uh, some encouragement in terms of, in terms of religion, what we, the workspace system. Uh, we can't do it. We're not designed to do it. We're not supposed to do it. The Christian life is not designed to be uh, perfection. Of course, we, we strive after the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who lived the perfect life. He's the one who did it for us because we couldn't. And of course, we want to strive for that. Jesus is our example. But if we have faulty expectations, if, if we don't understand that we have a flesh nature that just is fighting us all the time, if we think we could be absolutely perfect all the time forever, and then inevitably when we do fall, which is going to happen, we have the flesh, we're going to be so stricken with, with fear and worry and, and shame and condemnation and that just comes from, from an improper expectation of what the Christian life is. And it's not supposed to be that way. Jesus is the one who's perfect. He's the one who lived the perfect life for us to save us. Now, we do our best to, to follow him, but we also have to understand that when we fall, God forbid, um, we don't have to beat ourselves up uh, so, so bad that we often do. We, just, we, we say, okay, Lord, I've messed up. I understand you've forgiven me, and help, help me to do better. Help me to do better instead of just sulking in, in, in our, uh, our foolishness and our sin. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 1.7 on the handout. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. 
Uh, this life with Jesus is supposed to be comforting and hopeful. It's supposed to be upward in grace, not downward in discouragement. And we can look at what Paul wrote to new believers uh, regarding why he sent Timothy to them. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, on the handout, it says, And sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So God wants us to be established and comforted in our faith. And, and Paul sent Timotheus because uh, he didn't want the Thessalonians to, be, uh, to lose their joy or to be driven off of course by bad information. He wanted them comforted and established concerning their faith. And that is also God's heart for us. His, his heart, his, his want, his desire is that his truth, like Jesus said, that the truth will set us free. He wants his truth to unburden us, to comfort us, and to establish us in our relationship with Jesus. And too often we walk around with burdens. We, we definitely walk around uncomforted and, and worried. And that's not what God wants for us in this life. Not at all. And Lord, help us. Um, yeah. Let's look at number one, establishing a biblical framework. Establishing a biblical framework. In light of all that we studied thus far, um, just in this and this and then the, the few chapters we looked at before, uh, we, we must perhaps embrace a major adjustment in our naturally assumed, um, what, what this book calls theological framework. We, we talked a lot about worldview. I mentioned a lot about worldview, how we see the world and, and what we do because of our beliefs. And this is true for everybody, whether someone's an atheist and they see the world in, in a flawed way, or whether we're Christians, children of God, and we see the world in a flawed way. Because we can do that too. We, we, if we have improper expectations, if we take our eyes off of Jesus and start trusting in our own works to make God happy, we have a flawed uh, theological framework. We have a flawed worldview. And what we need to do is we need to calibrate our understanding to what the Bible actually says, uh, the, the meaning of real Christianity. And when we think of Christian, Christian life, the Christian walk, we have to constantly remind ourselves, we, have, we do, have to, do have to think of a relationship with Jesus, not a religion, not a, a set of moral ethical codes to keep God happy. Um, Jesus, he knew how weak we were. He knew how, how uh, the scripture says we're but dust. He knew that, and he still died for us anyway. He, he deemed us worthy enough to, to die for. And that means he understands um, that we are going to mess up. He understands that we are not perfect. He understands all the problems that come with being a human, I mean, because he became one himself, and he, he still chose to die for us regardless. And we have to remind ourselves that, that it's not about working our way to him, it's that he came to save us and he does the work in us. And if we keep our eyes on him, constantly remind ourselves that we're going to have a much better time, for sure. Um, and it's just going to be, I guess I can just say that, it's just going to be a joyful walk with the Lord, instead of pain and suffering and having our joys taken away, stole, or given our joy away, I, should, I suppose I should say, uh, it'll be a much better walk with the Lord. So we were not saved into a system. We were not saved by a structure. Christianity is not a self-help program. We were saved by a person. We were introduced to a Savior precisely because we cannot save ourselves. And, and our walk, what we call Christianity is all about knowing him. It's all about knowing our Savior and walking in close relationship with him. So that's what we mean when, when we say that uh, we have a relationship over, over a religion, just walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. And probably about the, the most important thing, I guess, is, is it's all about being, uh, it's, about, it's all about loving and being loved by him. That's uh, those are the two most important commandments, really. I mean, love God, love our neighbor. It's all about love, and, and, and that's the whole point, pretty much. Uh, look at Philippians 3.10 on the handout. It says, That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And we have to understand that we were born into a family. We are called a child. We're called a son. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit, which is inseparable from God's heart. We were given new life and close fellowship. We were given a relationship with an intimate Savior and an intimate Redeemer. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 on the handout. This verse is really amazing. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. If we really just stop and think about that, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. We all know what that cost is the crucifix. We went over that last week, what Jesus went through. Got, got beat so bad, his spine could have been showing through his back. Uh, could have just died from the beating, but then he carried the cross and then he was crucified. 
And he did that for us. Uh, I would not want to go through that myself. I'm sure none of us would either. Um, but thankfully, we don't have to because he did it uh, for us. And, and he took, well, actually, let me, let me add to that. Not only did he take the most gruesome beating and the most, uh, literally the word crucifixion or the word excru- ex- uh, excruciating comes from the word crucifixion. He took the worst possible way to die upon himself. And not only that, he lived a perfect sinless life. You know, I mean, it's, it's one thing to, to, get, to get martyred, to get killed. That's, I mean, it's horrible pain, it, it's, but it's, it's over relatively quick. Now, imagine living a life where you, for, for 30 years you're constantly overcoming temptation, constantly overcoming doubt. That's, that might be more difficult than, than just getting killed, to be honest. Um, that, he, but he did that for us. Um, he, he endured pain and suffering for us. And I th- we all thank him for that, no doubt. It's... Um, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Praise the Lord. And then we look, look at Galatians 4, 6. It says, Because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then Ephesians 1, 13 as well. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye believed, ye are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we're, we're sons of God, and we have to consider the price of that. We're, we're bought with a price, and that, that price is, is priceless. Uh, and because we're sons of God, we've received the Spirit, and we receive that Spirit. We're sealed with that Holy Spirit after we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not our, our water baptism. It's, it's not uh, being uh, inducted into a church. It's when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that we're, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And this is all a relationship, not a religion. And this perspective is critical because it shapes everything about our Christian experience. We, we talked much about how, how non-believers view the world and how it affects their reasoning and their logic and their, even their thinking ability. If we don't view the world properly, if we don't view God properly, it's going to shape everything in the wrong way. And we, we don't want that. Uh, we, we, to fix this, we simply need to adjust our, our thinking to God's word. If you would turn to, to Romans chapter 12 for me. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to look at verse 2. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it reads, I'll, just, I'll start from verse 1, rather. I beseech you, uh, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this, this is coupled with 2 Corinthians 10, where it talks about how we should take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So if we consider these two verses, if we're watching all of our thoughts, if we're comparing all of our thoughts to what the Scripture says, which it's very important to do, um, there, there's a medical thing called intrusive thoughts, um, Basically, it's, it's unwanted thoughts that come into our head that tells us to do things that we would never do. Um, and we all can relate to this. I'm pretty sure this happens to every single person. We're in spiritual warfare. Uh, like, for example, I got, this, I got this new phone several months ago. And one thought I had is when I was leaving the store, what if I just threw this out the window to see how it looked? It's like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. And, and, and we have just ridiculous things come, come in, coming into our head. Um, oh, that wall looks hard. I wonder what happens if I just punch it. Like, you know, we would never do things like that. Those are obviously wrong. I'm sure you can all uh, relate in some regard where we just have a stupid thought pop into our head that we don't want there, and it's just annoying and it pesters us. And, but those are the obvious ones that we can recognize. Now think about what gets through. Right? We, we can recognize the seriously stupid ones. I just got this new phone. I'm not going to break it. You know, I don't know why I have a thought telling me to break my phone. But what about the ones that we aren't so privy to that slip through our mind. And we are all well aware that one bad thought can ruin our entire day. That's all it takes. So we have to exercise extreme diligence. The scripture says to be sober, be alert. We have a, a, an enemy, like a roaring lion, looking to devour us. We have to constantly be, be sober, be diligent. and It's a hard task, but watch every single thought that comes into our head. Every, every single one. And we have to get into the practice of, of addressing those thoughts and, and comparing them to scripture. Okay, I have this thought in my head. What does the scripture say about this thing? Good, bad, then we make our decision from there. And, and often, often we can kind of get into a groove or a habit of just kind of going on autopilot throughout the day and not even considering our thoughts. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves angry, 
tired, distressed throughout at the end of the day. And it's because we, we let something in that we should not have. And if we, if we consider, uh, let me just read this again, then I'll take you to 2 Corinthians. But uh, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're supposed to renew our mind constantly, renew our mind constantly. And of course, that comes through the scripture. We, we consider what goes on through our head. We consider our thoughts. We compare it to the scripture and see how it stands up. That's, it's, we have to do that. Uh, or it's going to be very bad for us. If you would uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 is where I'll start. Actually, I'll start at verse 4. No, I'll start at verse 3. 2 <laughs> uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, it says, every thought to the obedience of Christ. And this is, it's toilsome, it, it takes work, and it's difficult to constantly watch our mind and, and compare the things that come into our mind with Scripture, but it's, it's necessary, it must be done. Of course, I can say there's going to be a time when we don't have to do this. In eternity, we're not going to have temptation. We're not going to have doubt. We're not going to have to constantly look over our, sh- our shoulder for the enemy. We're just going to have perfect peace, and that's going to be forever. It's in- incomprehensible, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, but casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that comes into our mind that exalts itself, that, that raises itself up against God's promises. That's, I mean, that's basically what Satan did in the garden, right? Hath God said, he cast doubt on it, and then he just straight up called God a liar. God didn't say that. You won't die. You surely won't die. That's exalting. It's, it's, knowledge, or it's language that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. God said one thing. Satan said another thing. And that's what happens in our head. We have things come into our head that says, oh, the Bible doesn't actually mean that. Or it'll just, just lie. It might even just say, oh, the Bible's not true. Just foolish things that come, come into our head at times. And if we're not diligent, if we're not casting these imaginations down, they're going to cause us serious trouble. Um, pain, worry, hopelessness, uh, some things that, that the Christian should not be living in by any means. And, and the second part of that verse says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we have to constantly watch our mind, constantly try these things that come into our, 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 our mind, our head, and see how they, they uh, stack up to the obedience of Christ, to what the Word of God says. And if they don't add up, if it's against the scripture, then we cast it out. We cast it down. And, and couple that with Romans 12 too. That's how we renew our mind. We have, we have to always look introspectively. What are we doing? Are we doing things wrong? Could we do things better? What does the scripture say about how we're talking, how we're thinking, how we're acting? And if, if it's not adding up to what the scripture says, we need to change. And that's how we renew our mind. And it's just a constant walk. And it's going to be going on for the rest of our, our Christian life. And it's never going to end. And it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 5, if you would. Hebrews chapter 5. I'll be looking at verse 12. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 reads, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers... You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So when we first become children of God, we're on milk. We're, the, the scripture likens it to being a babe, a baby. All we can understand is just the core doctrines of Christianity. You know, Jesus died for our sins. He rose from the dead. I'm saved. The Bible is the word of God. We understand these things. But as we continue walking with the Lord, the scripture says strong meat. We get strong meat. Strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And one thing I can tell you, I'm a young Christian, but I don't know anything. The more I learn, the more I realize I know nothing. 
And this is just going to continue and continue and continue. And we can never catch ourselves becoming complacent with the scripture, thinking, oh, I've learned enough. Oh, I've, I've, you know, I, I'm where I need to be. Uh, pastor said something in a message uh, several, I think a couple weeks ago. It's like, if you're not going forward, you're going backward. And that's just the reality. If, if we're not growing in the Lord, if we're not consistently exercising our senses, getting this strong meat, we're going to, to fall behind. We're gonna, just going to be tempted and we're going to fall. And it's, it seems to be the, the, the message here is that we're going to have a bad time as a Christian. And God does not want us to have a, a hopeless Christian life. He wants us to have joy and peace and love and all the fruit of the Spirit, all of it. We don't have to walk around sulking and, and admitting defeat and, and feeling hopeless because we're not good enough. Jesus is good enough, and if we just keep our eyes on him, then it'll be, uh, it'll be fine and dandy, I guess I could say. But just look, look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, what it tells us to do. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism and of the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do, this will we do if God permit. So we're actually commanded to, to go on from these things. It's not that we don't keep these things in our, in our mind, that we remember these things. But as a child of God, we, the only thing that... Uh, um, Jesus risen from the dead should not be the only thing that we know. We should not just become a Christian and be like, okay, that's it. That's all I, you know, that's all I know. I'm going to go on with my life. We're actually commanded in the scripture to continue, to, to get to this strong meat, and that's going to continue for the rest of our, of our, our Christian walk, of our, our lives with the Lord. And let's see where I was here. Um, we were saved by a person. Jesus saved us. And, yeah, so we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And we have to have this this worldview, which the Holy Spirit helps us with, but if we don't look at the Scripture, if we don't renew our mind with the Scripture, we're going to have an improper worldview. We're going to have an improper understanding of what the Christian walk is supposed to be. We're going to have a false expectation, and we're going to have a, a, a joyless, a hopeless Christian walk. So we need to always be calibrating, comparing our mind, what we're doing and thinking, to what the Scripture says. And that's the only way we can we can walk in joy because the devil is going to constantly throw darts. It's never going to stop. We're going to have one victory, and then he's going to find another weakness in our armor and then attack again. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's just the reality of life. It, it, it's unfortunate that we, I mean, we were born into this world. There's nothing we could do about it. Thankfully, we have a Savior that helps us with it. But if we, you know, if we just lay down and, and, and say it's hopeless and uh, we can't do anything, it's, first of all, that's not how the Lord wants us to live, but that's, uh, I mean, it's just a defeated Christian life, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so we have to understand, this is another proper expectation. We're, we're born into a fallen world. We're born into, into a world with an enemy who wants to destroy us, and we're not supposed to just lay down and accept it. Uh, follow the Lord. He's the one who works in us. He's the one who helps us. The Holy Spirit is stronger than, than any enemy. Um, I just remember Jesus went, when, when, when the people who were possessed by devils saw Jesus, they were just in absolute terror. And we, how, how come we, when we have God living in us, we become afraid at, at persecution, at, at, at spiritual darkness? It's supposed to be the other way around. They, were, they, they, asked, they begged Jesus to, to put them in some pigs. And so we shouldn't have any fear. We shouldn't have any, uh, any worry in this world because the Holy Spirit is far greater than, than the enemy is, far greater. Let's see here. Our, our faith context or our theological framework or our, wor- our worldview, uh, it's, it's framed by our expectations. What we believe to be true creates our uh, expectation of, of how it works. So, like, for example, we talked about atheists a long time ago. Atheists don't believe in God, so they're not going to expect miracles to be true. So if they see a miracle right in front of their face, they're going to come up with some other reason to explain it away. And in, in the same vein... Um, if we believe wrongly about God, something can happen to us and we can have an improper expectation or un- improper understanding of it. Like, just look at Job. Um, Job's friends believe that because he was going through all this trouble, that he did something wrong. And a lot of us can have that idea. It's like, okay, why is this trouble, why is this struggle happening in our lives? But that doesn't mean we did something wrong. We could be perfectly in sync walking with the Lord like Job was, and then things just start uh, happening. And if we have an improper expectation, like, like Job's friends did, for example, um, it's going to be painful. It's going to be hopeless, dis, um, distress, depression, uh, pain. 
pain. And again, and again, I repeat myself, that's not what the Christian life is supposed to be. And we, we can think of this worldview or this theological framework, uh, we can think of it as like a steel structure of a building where everything else is, is built on top of it. And it's all resting on the strength of the steel. If the steel is weak or flawed, the building is doomed. And the same is going to be true with our, our Christian worldview, how we interpret the Bible, what we believe to be true about the Bible, what we expect from the Bible. If it's based on faulty knowledge, if it's not based on the truth, basically, everything's going to crumble when, when trouble comes or, or trial comes. And unfortunately, many Christians have built their theological framework or their worldview with faulty assumptions or expectations. And what actually happens is they're they move from, from faith, from grace, to religion and works, and um, this causes them to live with performance-based principles rather than graced, grace-based truth. And their theology or their understanding of their relationship with God, it, it's basically summed up by try harder, get better, be more disciplined, and employ greater human effort to meet or even exceed the expectations of a perfect, infinite God. And I, I, will, I will say this, I mean, even like a, a hasty read through the Bible will reveal that there are commandments that we are expected to follow. And, and God does call us to live a holy life, which is a reflection of his, his work in our hearts. That's, that is what God expects us. But we have to understand that, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I'll make this very clear. I'm not talking about whether or not we should obey God in our lifestyles. We certainly should obey the Lord in, in, in how we act and think and walk. But the, the, the point is um, why we obey. What is the reason that we are obeying? And we have to nail down the fact that our, our, our obedience has nothing to do with God's acceptance. Uh, we, don't, we don't make God happy. We don't earn his, his salvation by our obedience. And if we don't have a solid grasp of this biblical truth, the Christian life is going to be an exercise in, in guilt, shame, and frustration. And it's eventually all just going to collapse and this is the reason why many Christians can, can stop even wanting to serve the Lord because they're, they're trusting in their own works. They're, they're trying to do their own discipline. They're trying to do their own uh, ability. And it's just going to lead them to discouragement. And I'll, I'll make that clear. It's, we are expected to do things, but it's not going to be in our strength. We have to rely on the Lord to help us um, and not think that we can earn God's acceptance, earn his, his salvation by what we do. And of course, again, none of us would ever say, that we're believing that, per se. We, don't, we, don't, we, all, we all believe we're saved by grace through faith, but we have to analyze our, uh, practically how we act and how we think. Because like, those thoughts that slip through our head, that, that's how deception works. Like, we don't know that we're deceived. We don't know that we're doing something wrong until somebody comes and tells us, or the Lord shines a light on it, and then we're like, oh, how could I have missed that all this time? And the Lord will do that. He'll, if we pray hard prayers like, Lord, show me where I'm going wrong. Just, you know, use my life. Help me because I can't see what I'm doing wrong. I'm, Lord, search my heart. I'm doing my best. Help me. He will. Uh, but that, yeah, that's just, just, just the nature of deception. We don't understand that we're deceived until we're shown that we are. And we may not, we, we may not say that, oh, yeah, we're trusting in our works. We would all say that, we're, yeah, we're trusting in Jesus to save us. But when it comes to how we're practically living out our lives, we really need to, to introspect and consider, okay, why did I do this? Why did I do that? From what motivation did it come from? Oh my, maybe I actually am trying to please God uh, through my own uh, self-expended discipline and, and, and trial and tribulation. Or, or if I, um, th this was a big problem. Like I mentioned Martin, I, I've talked about Martin Luther, how he would, um, he would, he would confess for hours, and he, they, they're like, these people like, would beat themselves up. They, they think that starving themselves, like extreme asceticism, would make God happy. And that's not the reality. Um, so there's these deceptions in our life. We, we, we have to understand who God really is to, um, I guess I could just say, have a, a, a fun Christian life, I guess. Because if we have a, a faulty understanding or a, a fulfilling, peaceful Christian life, because we have, if we have a faulty understanding of who the Lord is, which comes from a lack of understanding of his word, it's just going to be hopeless, uh, full of guilt and frustration. It's, it could eventually collapse to where uh, we don't even want to serve the Lord. And of course, we, we'd still be saved, but that's not, it's not what the Lord wants for us, is to have a defeated Christian life. And I, I really thought I could finish this lesson, but I'm not even close. But let's pray, uh, and yeah, let's just thank the Lord and, and, and pray.
Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your goodness and for saving our souls. Scripture says, uh, uh, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Lord, help us to truly understand. Open our hearts and open our eyes and ears to see what Jesus really went through for us, Lord. And after that, I pray you would, you would teach us how to have a proper, biblically-based, uh, truthful relationship with you, Lord. We don't have to, to take a whip to ourselves to please you, Lord. That's not what you want. Help us to, to truly see who you are, how you are, how, and how you love us, Lord. And help us to serve you through love towards you, Lord. Not, not from a perspective or, or a position of trying to earn, earn you, Lord. Because we, you saved us through grace. Uh, we cannot possibly have any more of your love, Lord. We are your children. We love you. You love us unconditionally. Teach, teach us to love you unconditionally, Lord. Uh, but you love us unconditionally, and you saved us even though you knew who we were and what we would do even in the future. And, and we thank you for that, Lord. We just pray you just continually, continually work in our hearts. Fill us with your spirit. Equip us with your full armor. You just bind all forces of darkness from us and just show us time and time again, Lord, your goodness and help us to serve you each and every day, Lord. And I pray that you would, you would bless pastor's message. Just open all of our eyes and your ears and, and help us to, I mean, Lord, we, we just come here to learn more about you and to love you more, Lord. So ultimately, just help us to love you more, Lord. And uh, we thank you, Father, for sending, for sending Jesus to die for our sins, uh, rising from the dead, and, and sending the Holy Spirit to, to convict us when we need it, yes, but also comfort us when we need it as well, Lord. And just thank you for your goodness and your grace. And we, we, we love you. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing, what you will do. We pray all these things in your son's name, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.